welcome to The Election Show. I'm your host, Dr. Christina Greer. I'm an Associate Professor of Political Science at Fordham University and the co-host of the FAQ NYC podcast. Joining me this week, as always, via Zoom is Matt McDermott, Communication Strategist and Vice President of Whitman Insight Strategies. And also with us today is Lincoln Mitchell, Political Analyst and Professor of Political Science at Columbia University. Welcome, gentlemen. Good to see you again. Good to see you. It's, oh, uh, I'm gonna miss you so once this election is over. So I would sing, it's the final countdown, but I don't know if we have publishing rights, so I won't sing, it's the final countdown. But Matt, I'm gonna start with you. We're just a few days away from November 3rd. People all across the country have been voting early. We're seeing numbers that we've never seen before and that many pollsters didn't even imagine. We've already surpassed the total voting number of Americans who voted in the 1960 election of Kennedy v. Nixon, uh, and we haven't even had proper election day yet. Uh, how are you feeling? What does the early voting tell you? And then we'll get into some of the pros and cons of, of the anxiety that so many people have uh, leading up to November 3rd. Look, there is nothing more exciting than seeing the American people vote, and in this election, vote in the historic numbers that they are. Uh, you look at states like Texas, where the total turnout has already surpassed 2016, literally the most voters that have ever voted in the state of Texas, and we still have a few days left. Uh, and you look at places like North Carolina and Georgia, which are just behind Texas uh, and are also about to exceed their 2016 turnout. So the good news is people are voting, which is exactly what Democrats have been urging for months now, that this is the election of our lifetimes and everyone needs to get out and vote and have their voice heard. Now, the problem, which we still face, is the Republican strategy, which has really been twofold. One is, for months leading up to the election, they have literally tried to prevent people from voting. They have limited the number of return drop boxes where people can drop off their mail ballots. They've reduced the number of hours when it comes to early voting. Uh, they're literally trying to make it harder to vote. And in the last few days, they've, they've adjusted their strategy slightly given the historic turnout we're seeing, which is now to try to prevent the count of votes that were legitimately cast. And you can see that in states like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Minnesota, where in the past few days, Republicans have filed lawsuits to prevent those states from counting legitimate ballots. You saw in the past day in Minnesota, uh, the court in that state, which is Republican dominated, come out with a decision that essentially says that Minnesota can't count ballots that were received after election day, even if those ballots are postmarked by election day, which is completely contrary to state law in Minnesota. And so that's the Republican strategy heading into these final days. They see the writing on the wall. They see the historic turnout that's happening. And so their solution is, how can we prevent ballots from being counted that were fairly and legitimately counted uh, and, and cast in this election. And so that's the real challenge. I think Democrats are still turning out the vote in ways that are both historic and they need to, to counter Donald Trump. But there should be real concern about what's happening in our courts, in our legal system, to prevent a free and fair election from taking place. So Lincoln, I mean, based on what Matt's just said, do you think that the voter suppression and, and the sort of cheating that's happening on the, the part of Republicans uh, through the court systems Will that be enough to deliver a victory to Donald Trump? I'm going to You're paraphrase something Matt said, was that we, we should be concerned about what's going on in our courts to prevent a free and fair election. That's called stealing an election. And that's what the yeah. uh, Republican Party through the courts, and obviously in cahoots with Donald, Trump's is trying to, Donald Trump is trying to do. Will it be enough? I'm not sure. Biden's poll lead is pretty big. And you know we're beginning the last week or so, we're seeing this spate of, of articles, you know how Trump could really win, the secret Trump vote out there. And the reason for that has to do with it's a lot easier to pitch an article saying I'm going to write an article that says Trump can win rather than I'm just another boring political analyst saying that the guy who's the big lead in the polls is going to win. However, if this is a free and fair election, the guy with the big lead in the polls is going to win. And therefore, the Republican Party, because the consequences for Donald Trump are so extreme if he loses this election, it is a lifetime of legal hassles not just for him, but for the five or six people about which he cares. That's been true since the moment he put the, his hand on the Bible in January of 2017, and that's where we are now. That's We were never going to be anywhere else. The other thing I would add is that we've never had an election quite like this one with regards to early voting. Now, some states, Utah, 
the state of Washington, Oregon, Hawaii have been doing this for a long time. And this is just the way they do it. Others like California were kind of halfway there, but others have really been doing it differently. And what that means for me is that we have to be a little careful about putting too much faith in these numbers. We know there's been a big early turnout, but we don't know whether those are people who are already going to vote. So we, we, know, we can look at some of the peripherals and think it's probably good for Biden, but we don't know for sure. And also we know from every bit of data that we've seen that Trump still has a very strong and very committed base that will come out for him. The problem for Donald Trump is that in the days before COVID, in the normal days, normal elections, in states where there was some optional mail-in balloting, you always wanted your votes to come in early because that was money in the bank. And th then you could go on election day and get the people who don't always vote. Trump has now pushed all his votes into election day. What happens if there's a COVID spike? What happens if there's a snowstorm? The answer to that question is that Biden will open up a bigger margin in places like Wisconsin, where there is a, a COVID spike in Michigan, where there are snowstorms in early November. And if that happens, on the one hand, some might say, well, that will help Biden because it went by a bigger margin, which is true, but it will give fodder to that Donald Trump narrative that his cult uh, followers believe that somehow this was stolen. The, the uh, COVID hoax forced people to right. stay at home. You can see Trump going down that bizarre road right. as well. Well, since we were last together, I mean, and we know that there's nothing beneath this president as far as what he will do or say. Um, but Matt, since we were last together, Amy Coney Barrett has been sworn in uh, as a Supreme Court justice. So when we were together last week, we talked about uh, the inevitable, but it has happened. At the final hour, Mitch McConnell was able to, to ignore rules uh, for the Senate. To, to make votes where there wasn't a quorum, where Democratic senators did show up. Chuck Schumer was essentially helpless against this tide. And now we have uh, Amy Coney Barrett sworn in by Clarence Thomas, right? The, the black justice who replaced Thurgood Marshall, Amy Coney Barrett, uh, the female justice who replaced Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I mean, we couldn't see uh, more differences ideologically uh, at all. Right. Do you think that's gonna hurt the Republicans or, or galvanize the Republicans uh, by putting her on the bench with fewer than eight days uh, before the election when she was sworn in. You can see the extent to which it's galvanized Democrats and, and not only galvanized Democrats, but I think really put in stark terms what Republicans have done to our democracy over the last decade or more and the need for Democrats to finally step up and not only hold them accountable, but fundamentally reform the systems that are so out of whack. I mean, just look at what's been done to our judicial system under Republican control over the last few years. It has totally uh, gotten them out of whack and forced us into an unfair system wherein the minority party of the Republicans can now have supermajority control over what legislation the Supreme Court does or does not decide uh, is fair and constitutional. And you've seen the response from fairly moderate Democrats uh, particularly in the Senate, who for a long time have been apprehensive about any sort of reform to our system, finally stepping up and saying enough is enough. We need to do something to reform our system. You look at someone like Chris Coons, Democrat senator from uh, Delaware, who for a long time has been a traditionalist when it comes to reforms of our democratic systems, coming out and pretty explicitly saying that Republican efforts uh, to push uh, Barrett onto the court, we're going to force Democrats in the Senate, were they to get a majority next year, to do something about it. So I, I think it's galvanized Democrats, and I think it's, it's, for better or worse, forced us into a situation where we finally have to realize what's happening to our democratic systems and fundamentally reform them. So, and I, I think that that's a fascinating point. And Lincoln, I mean, Matt lays this out. What do you think that the Amy Coney Barrett swearing in actually does mean for uh, Democratic senators who are on the ballot? And I'm thinking explicitly, we've talked briefly about Iowa, Arizona. We saw how the president uh, treated Martha McSally at the, the latest rally. Jamie Harrison raising more money than any Senate candidate, well, I believe in, in history. Uh, we've got uh, Georgia looking good on two fronts, right? There's a viral clip of, of John Ossoff uh, just laying out the case for uh, uh, his opponent's theft and, and cheating and grift and lying. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. We've got Susan Collins uh, asked three times in a local debate and couldn't once answer whether or not she would support the president uh, 
on November 3rd. And so we have a lot of the Republican senators on the defensive uh, and largely because of their votes for Amy Coney Barrett uh, in the final hour. What do you think about that? Well, it's a very interesting question. And, and Susan Collins is perhaps the most interesting because she voted against Amy Coney Barrett, right? And she did that because McConnell had the votes, right? If that's a 50-50 vote or 49-50 vote, she's gonna go and support her, her Senate majority leader in Donald Trump. So she's trying to thread a needle and go back to the people of Maine and say, look, I'm not really in Trump's back pocket. We will see Sarah Gideon still seems to be leading that race. For the rest of these senators, it's very much a double-edged sword because to, to kind of what, pick up on something Matt was saying, what this nomination process did is it put an end to the days when Republican voters care more about the, port or the courts than Democratic voters. Democratic voters care about the courts a lot, and they are being mo motivated to vote in, in these competitive Senate races around the country precisely so that this doesn't happen again. There's an additional piece of this. So Mitch McConnell, who is, I don't think, in a particularly competitive race, but you know, the Senate majority leader, he can go back and his senators go back and say, this is why we put Republicans to their voters. This is why we want Republicans on the Senate so we can get conservative justices. And for Republican voters, that is in fact a very big goal of theirs. So that's a legitimate political argument, my, my opinions about those justices notwithstanding. However, there's another side to that, which is that now that you've got a six to three majority, right? Why do we need you there? Why do we need someone like, I don't know, Lindsey Graham, who's an apologist for this criminal regime in the White House? Why do we need you there? You did what we wanted to. So that's how it cuts the other way. And that's why the, the Republican campaign is hit so hard and it's fading now because it's not getting enough traction on this court packing issue. Because the fear of Democrats putting judges on the court is the kind of thing that they think might mobilize their voters. The most striking thing about the Amy Coney Barrett nomination and confirmation is that, you know, it was Arab Rosh Hashanah when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died and I was at a, we were having some people socially distanced in our yard. And I said to one of my friends who was not, I would say not a supporter of the president, would be an understatement. And I shared the news with him and he was very upset. And I said, you know what, with it, they'll, have a, uh, they'll have that new person on the court before the election. And if I could figure that out, you know, eating dinner, you can bet Mitch McConnell knew that. This, wasn't, this was always going to go this way, but like so many things we've seen in 2020, I don't think it's moved a lot of voters. I don't think it changed a lot of opinions. Well, let's bring it back to the trail. Uh, you know, Florida yet again, is one of those states where you have people who are, are very conservative and they support the president. They've been going to rally after rally, shoulder to shoulder, no masks. We've also seen uh, Barack Obama spend a lot of time in say Miami and Southern Florida uh, to galvanize voters on behalf of Joe Biden. It's been interesting to see the strategy, Matt, of Kamala Harris in certain locations, Joe Biden and others, and now Barack Obama in the final hour uh, being deployed to a place like Florida to sort of do the third man work. Uh, do you think that that's having a real impact or, you know, are people just sort of remembering the Obama days and that's fine, but they really want to hear more from Biden and Harris or, or how do you think he's being deployed and could he be more useful in some place, some other state? So there are two things I think we can learn about the campaign schedule in these closing days that I think actually tell us a lot about where this election's headed. The first is you look at Democrats, you mentioned Barack Obama, Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, also out on the campaign trail. And where are they sending these Democrats in the final days? They're sending them to South Florida, they're sending them to South Texas, and they're sending them into places like Philadelphia and Detroit. What are all of those have in common? They're all places where Democrats need to turn out votes among Latinos and African Americans. And so Democrats are strategically, given how much of an early vote we've seen, are strategically using Barack Obama, Kamala Harris, and Joe Biden to get out the vote, to turn out Latinos and African Americans who naturally, for a lot of reasons, don't vote as often by early vote and are more often to vote by election day. And so what they're trying to do is maximize democratic turnout in places like Miami, in places like the Rio Grande Valley, in places like Detroit, uh, to really ensure victories in those states. On the flip side, I think we can also learn a lot about where Republicans are sending Donald Trump in the final days. Donald Trump come this weekend will have spent two full days in Iowa and will have spent two full days in Georgia, both states that he won pretty substantially in 2016 and both states which frankly should not be competitive for Democrats with Donald Trump in the White House. And so Republicans are playing defensive. They're having to go into states uh, like Texas, like Georgia, like Iowa, like Ohio, places that should not be competitive. And so that's when you start to look at the overall electoral map 
and you start seeing what's happening here is in the final days of this campaign, every single state that Democrats and Republicans are going to to campaign are all states that Donald Trump won in 2016, both in the upper Midwest and the Sun Belt. And it starts leading to a question of if Republicans are having to defend so many states this year, what are the actual chances of them actually being victorious? And I think that's why you see the conventional wisdom that exists, both between that and the sustained polling lead that Joe Biden has had, would tend to suggest that the Democrats have a very strong chance of winning this election so long as votes are counted fairly and freely. And I think that that's the key piece that you and, and Lincoln have always said. You know, it's like the math looks good for Biden, asterisk. Yeah as long as this is a free and fair election. Exactly. And so Lincoln, you know, going building off of what Matt said, you know, earlier in the week, uh, the president had a rally in Omaha where he essentially abandoned, abandoned some of his supporters. Many of them had to go to the hospital uh, for hypothermia and frostbite. And then fast forward a few days, he has another rally in the parking lot actually of an early voting uh, uh, station, the Buccaneers uh, Stadium. And so people could either vote early and then attend the rally or attend the rally and then go and vote. Uh, but it was blazing hot and many people ended up at the hospital uh, after the rally as well. I mean, it always makes me uh, scratch my head because it seems as though the president doesn't really care about his supporters. I mean, since they're oftentimes shoulder to shoulder with no masks on either in extreme cold or extreme heat uh, and the repercussions are just what they are. But going off of what Matt said about where the, the president sort of, he's a little spread thin. I mean, there's so many states that he's trying to defend. I wanted us to go a little north and talk a bit about Michigan and Wisconsin. You mentioned those those before, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts about sort of the, the president's attacks on Governor Whitmer and whether or not that'll trickle down to some of the voters in Michigan, and also the spikes that we're seeing in Wisconsin. We know that both of those states are somewhat 50-50, and they have these very strong, uh, historic, uh, conservative veins throughout the state. Uh, I wanted you to talk to us a little bit more about the president's chances in those two states. I'm on calls every day with activists in Wisconsin and Michigan. So you pick the right two states. I'm not just New York and California here. I've been talking to people there as well. I mean, the polls in both states show that uh, Biden is winning. Con these are both difficult states to convert that into an actual victory. Michigan, as we know from the kidnapping attempt on Governor Whit Whitmer, which Donald Trump seems to celebrate as if it were some kind of a good thing rather than a really a serious crime, um, has a very strong tradition of right-wing and white supremacist militias. And that has that state on edge. If there is a state that is ripe, ripe for post-election, uh, I don't wanna say violence, but post-election activism from the right and potential violence from the right, it is Michigan. And therefore it is essential that the voters in Michigan, one, come out in huge numbers, which seems to be happening, and they vote in, in big numbers, but also they be prepared both to be a little patient, right? I'm not talking about the malicious because we can't really get through to them, but that all the voters in Michigan, everyone's gonna have to take a deep breath because both in Michigan and in Wisconsin, voting doesn't begin in advance. We talked a lot about Florida. Florida's a big electoral prize, but also they count early. So we could have a result by midnight. We're not gonna have a result by midnight in Wisconsin and Michigan. So what concerns me is that those are the states where Donald Trump is gonna say, stand back and stand by and now go in, right? because he's got those kind of bases there. We saw what happened in Kenosha. We saw what happened in, in Wisconsin with Governor Whitmer. And he has the kind of support there where he can mobilize them. And what needs to, the response needs to be massive and peaceful, and I'll say that again, peaceful demonstrations, not from the left, but from Americans who, in Michigan and Wisconsin who believe in democracy, who believe that the idea of counting all the votes is a bedrock principle of our democracy as opposed to the elections over when Donald Trump says it is. And I've actually, you know, I teach the constitution every year. That's actually not in the constitution. So let's count all the votes, but that needs to be the message. Not it's over when Donald Trump says it is, but these are two states with a really potential to explode. And there's the weather and the COVID spike, which may drive down Trump's voters in Wisconsin, which, you know, bad luck for Trump. He should have, he should not have ignored this pandemic and let a quarter, a quarter million Americans almost die. So, you know. Well, it's interesting because when I look at the electoral math, the 10 electoral votes in Wisconsin, the 16 in Michigan, you add that up, it's roughly a tenth of what uh, the president needs. But even if he does get those two states, I've been playing with that 270 to win map, uh, and it still looks bad for him. You know, it's, it, even if he gets Florida, it, it looks bad. And so I'm, I'm just fascinated by, by his strategy that we've talked about time and time again with this refusal 
to expand his base. And so Matt, you know, you're my favorite democratic strategist. Um, when we hear the president on the stump, this is what's been fascinating to me. He has this uh, apocalypse theory of what happens when Biden gets into office, which is everything that is happening right now under his watch, right? Sure. You won't be able to have birthday parties with your friends. You won't be able to celebrate Christmas with your family. You won't be able to go trick-or-treating. Your kids will be homeschooled, right? You won't be able to go to your sporting events. You won't be able to shop freely or go to restaurants. All of these things are currently happening for those of us who are sheltering in place and following the letter of the law and listening to Dr. Fauci and other scientists. And so he's framing the future uh, as, a, as a Biden presidency, which is really what so many millions of Americans have experienced for the past seven months. And, and this is reality. Whereas Biden is, it seems as though he's trying to walk us through various choices we have to go to the polls and make a decision about our future. I will bring in scientists. I will bring in a diverse group of people. I will not actually continue with this rhetoric. You won't have to worry about me at 3 a.m. on a rant being erratic. And I think those two strategies are so different because we do know that some people are just motivated by fear. And the president has done that, uh, I would say exceptionally well with his base, uh, the fear of the immigrant, the fear of the Muslim, the fear of uh, black people taking over your cities and your suburbs. Uh, so how would you sort of walk us through those two strategies, trying to mobilize and motivate say undecided voters, and by undecided, not necessarily undecided between Biden and Trump, but undecided as to whether or not they're going to stay home on November 3rd or actually participate in democracy. Yeah, and, and this election has brought the cliche into reality. We, we always sit here every four years and say this is the most important election of our lifetimes. This literally is. You should be voting as if lives are on the line because they are. You look at new estimates that are out this week of the coronavirus and what this next wave is going to look like. And those estimates are pretty black and white. If we do exactly what we're doing today, we're probably gonna lose 400,000 lives in America by February. If we relax our policies, if we loosen our mask usage, if we have a president in Donald Trump who says we have to reopen and people should just move on with their lives, that number jumps up to 515,000. If we do what Joe Biden says, which is more aggressive mask policies, more aggressive understanding of places we need to control when there's an outbreak, that 400,000 number goes down. So let's just put this in stark terms. If we vote and reelect Donald Trump into office, we lose at a minimum 115,000 lives that don't need to be lost by February. That is just an immeasurable number uh, and really speaks to what's on the line in this election. We are voting as to whether we should save over 100,000 people from unnecessarily dying from a pandemic. If that doesn't motivate you to go out and vote in this election, uh, man, I don't know what to tell you. And, and so I, I just cannot underline enough the effect that this pandemic is having on this election, not only just in terms of how we vote and when we vote and where we vote, but the outcome of this election will determine whether or not we can save lives heading into this next surge. So I, I think if we do anything over these next few days, it's to keep that in mind and make sure our friends and our family are going out there and voting. Because look, I, I get it. If you're sitting here and watching this show right now, chances are you like the rest of us have already voted, but we all have friends and we all have family who just aren't as energized and aren't as motivated and I think we all need to collectively make the case to them over the next few days why this election is so important and why you have to go out and vote and make your voice heard. Right. And, and Lincoln, in the last two minutes we have here, you know, as Matt laid out, you know, the president's saying the virus is just going to miraculously disappear. Don't worry, we'll get this, this vaccine. Sure thing. You know, it's coming. It's in the mail. Basically, the check is in the mail, as he's told so many creditors. Uh, so in the last two minutes, what, are, what should we expect these last few days and what should we expect on Election Day? Uh, what do you think? In the last few days, we should expect the Biden-Harris campaign, the Democratic campaign, to keep doing what they're doing. They're very focused, they're very disciplined, and they're playing very, very conservative in terms of stylistic hand, and I would expect that not to change. I would expect Donald Trump to descend more into madness, anger, and erratic behavior, and then the polls will close, and then things will get really bad. I expect Donald Trump to declare victory by midnight on Tuesday night. Again, not promising, but I would expect that. And I would expect, and then I don't know what will happen. 
and, I, and I, there is a broad possibility of outcomes and we should be prepared for any of those. Donald Trump supporters may take to the streets. They may take to the street with weapons. They may not be as many as they think. It may be an embarrassment like at some of these other right-wing demonstrations or they could commit acts of violence. The uh, people who believe in democracy and counting the votes should be prepared to go to the streets peacefully and demonstrate and demand that we wait and count the votes. But I don't know what we're gonna happen. The theme for 2020 and the theme of coronavirus pandemic is uncertainty. And we're gonna have even more uncertainty in the next few weeks. Matt, in the last minute, what do you expect the last few days on election day and, and the day after? Yeah, I, one thing to be clear about, Joe Biden will win the popular vote in this election. And we, the American people, need to make sure that that's enough to get him into the White House. I, I cannot be more clear than that. A man, a Democrat, is going to win the popular vote for the eighth out of ninth time in the past decade and a half. That is enough to get them into the White House. And we need to make sure that we are doing what we can in those swing states to make sure that the Electoral College follows along. So on election night, gentlemen, what two states or three states will you really keep your eye on? Matt? Uh, North Carolina and Florida. Those two states are the fastest to count votes in the system that we have. If Joe Biden wins either of them, this election's over. Okay. And Lincoln, in the last minute, what two or three states will you have your eye on? Those two for that reason, but also the kind of Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, not for who's going to win because we won't know right away, but to see what's happening, to see what kind of violence or lack of violence, what kind of intimidation or lack of intimidation. I'll be watching for that throughout the day Tuesday. I agree with you, gentlemen. I also find it fascinating. You know, the one state we haven't really talked about much is Ohio. And in the past, that's definitely been a state that has been at the forefront of so many conversations. So I'll actually be keeping my eye on Ohio just because uh, the governor and the former governor have said some interesting things about the president. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Thank you all so much for being here with me yet again another week. I'm Dr. Christina Greer. Thanks for watching the election show. Goodbye, wear a mask, stay safe, and vote if you haven't done so.